but uh, it's an Air Force term for missing man formation would be the formation minus the uh, guy out of the formation. And so then I started thinking, well, it means that, huh? Well, that's kind of relevant too. But before I knew about the Air Force part of it, uh, it was handed down through the deadhead surfer friends of my sister Nancy. And I liked it before I even knew what it meant. It's interesting, though, to have a name that sort of makes reference to an absent person as though, I mean, it's not, you're not like, the band is not a tribute to Jerry Garcia or anything, but It was born sort of, out of his absence. Oh, do you but I'll, Well, I mean, I wouldn't be doing this if I was still playing with the Grateful Dead. I would be out on the road in Atlanta or something. But uh, it was, you know, born out of the yearning to play music and to keep the spirit alive. And it's just, uh, it needed to be done. But I mean, also you could call it Missing Man Formation, franchise it out, and I wouldn't have to show up. I could be the Missing Man, and I'd go, where's Will? So, you know, it can go a lot of ways. Well, let's talk a little bit about your spiritual journey since Jerry died. I know you had kind of a rough go of it for a while there. Mm-hmm, like the worst I ever had. It was, uh, well, I don't have the words to say it, but I didn't smile for about close to a year and uh, never laughed. I didn't leave the bed for a long time. Uh, it was the worst. I didn't expect to take it like that. I mean, I didn't feel that bad when my mom died. It was kind of a a relief in a way, uh, but it just kept on coming and it got worse and worse and it just, I thought, well, I hit bottom now and then some other damn thing would come up and uh, it just about ruined me. I, at one point I couldn't remember three chords in a row and so I thought, well, that's about it for the old career. I guess I packed my bags and moved to Mexico because it's over, you know. And then who would have me anyway because I was just like way too depressed and unlike my normal self because it was something I'd never gone through in my life before and I didn't. It was that and a few other factors involved at the same time that just made for a very unpleasant 95. Then we went on a summer tour and the vibe was kind of scary there. Things rioting and Jerry not feeling well and getting death threats, which people didn't even know about at the time. But Yeah, it seemed pretty <clears throat> apocalyptic sitting at home listening to it going down. I was really curious to know how it felt on stage when the, in the middle of Desolation Row and the crowd, the fences came down and people started charging into the place. That must have been quite a, a creepy feeling. Well, I heard this big uproar, kind of like when they go off on some really great part of, of a song. And uh, that attracted my attention. I heard it right through my earphones, which makes it harder to hear still. So it was a big, uh, a big ripple that was caused. So I look out the audience, and they're all looking the other way. And I could see pretty good. And I could make out the fence line, and then just bodies coming over. It was like, you know, D-Day or something. <laughs> you know, they were just <laughs> piling over the fence. and they, uh, audience it was already in was like applauding the, the thing and uh, it wasn't scary at the time it was just kind of interesting but then the ramifications of it came later when the police told us well they just busted the barrier down we can't protect you tomorrow gigs off Wow. and so it kind of had a big backlash effect to it I never feared for my safety I mean this is probably the safest place on earth to be as a Grateful Dead show I've always thought so. I mean, it sort of got a little, you know, questionable toward the end there. You know? well, I wouldn't have wanted to be on leaning against that fence when it came down. Yeah, it's really. Well, be that as it may, you did get through your period of depression and start playing music again. Yeah. That kind of helped bring me out. Uh, that and some friends that we were encouraging, my wife Lori and uh, Prairie and Bobby and Steve getting me out of the bedroom and back into playing music and it was oh so sad and then I, I started writing about it 
and I actually wrote lyrics to a couple of the songs, which is normally I rely on somebody else, like Lori or Hunter or Barlow. But I wrote a song about the experience, and it's called True Blue. It's about all of my friends. And that started, uh, then I started getting a little hopeful. And then I wrote about Jerry, uh, a song called Golden Days, which is, I don't know, there seems to be a lot of duality in the, in the songs I've been writing lately. It's about the bad side, but it has a shiny lining to it, kind of a silvery lining, semi aluminum, cool. aluminum foil lining. Well, we'll, be, we'll hear both of those, right? Yeah, if yeah. you want. Yeah, I mean, it's your show, man. Absolutely. Uh, but you do have, you also have, uh, uh, is there, is there, you have a, a Barlow lyric and a Hunter lyric also? Mm -hmm. Well, I have more than one Hunter lyric and more than one Barlow, Barlow lyric. Uh, just that the what's completed right now in the demo tape that I'm going to lay on you consists of uh, two Wellnick songs, and then there's a Hunter lyric called The Emperor's Suit, which he gave me credit on his book for doing before I'd even done it. But wow. we had worked it out a little bit. Well, let's go back and, and, and get a clean start on talking about that then. Uh, one of your songs here has a lyric by Robert Hunter. Yeah, The Emperor's Suit. And uh, it was music I had written 10 or more years ago, or started writing, and could never find a lyric that kind of summed up what the feeling was. You know, I can get my feelings across musically, but it's not often times I say it in words. So I borrowed Hunter's uh, Emperor's Suit. But there's lots of other songs. Uh, from his book that I'm working on, uh, Golden Stairs, uh, Whispering Jones, Walker After Midnight, which are in various states of readiment, but uh, you'll have to catch me later to hear those. So, but the Emperor's Suit was an existing lyric that fit nicely into the music you had? Is that how that worked? Mm-hmm. In fact, I just dug up a tape of Hunter uh, working with me on it, and it all came together when I started feeling better. It, it just, I realized the only thing that was going to make me not think about the ultimate doom of, that I couldn't get out of my mind uh, was to keep on hammering these songs. And then all these songs started bursting forth. And The Emperor's Suit was one that got knocked out pretty quick after waiting 10 years to hatch. And another uh, lyric that I've been uh, working with is, uh, Barlow, and the one of the songs that's done that you'll hear is uh, The Devil I Know, which we wrote a long, long time ago when the dead were still around, but uh, for whatever reasons, never learned it in the context of The Grateful Dead. And also he, uh, we were writing some other songs called uh, Swept Away, and a song called Waiting for the Song to Come, and... Excuse me, John, but I was slipping my mind. There's more coming from, from John, too. Well, we, we, will we get to hear any of these uh, in the live show? Oh, yeah. I would think so. Cool. And if he ever gets back to me, I don't know how to do email, so uh, it's hard to reach him. And uh, But I'm waiting for some lyrics, uh, more lyrics. And uh, you may or may not hear. I don't want to give away everything, but... Uh, at some point in time, you'll hear more than one song with Barlow writing the lyrics. When we've heard you play before with the Affordables, you did some uh, much missed old Grateful Dead favorites like The Golden Road and Here Comes Sunshine. I, you sort of tend to get credit for bringing Here Comes Sunshine back into the Grateful Dead repertoire. Well, I'll take it, you know, help. <laughs> it, uh, well, the Affordables worked it up, and we did a acapella introduction to it, which was different from the original version. And then uh, we whipped it out at one of the when we opened up for one of the Jerry Garcia band shows. So later on, when we're practicing with the Dead, uh, I said, "Hey, you know what about it? This is a good song. It's got vocals. There's four of us here. We can sing the hell out of it." And he goes, yeah, okay, uh, do we have a copy of Wake of the Flood? And we didn't. 
but I just so happened to have a copy of the Affordables. And he remembered that song from backstage. He liked it, kind of the arrangement as such. So it started off with the acapella vocals and boom. Yeah, it was real sweet to hear it. Back but in that, the <clears throat> didn't work that good when I suggested Golden Road, though. But you can't have everything. Yeah, you couldn't have everything. But uh, we did hear the Golden Road uh, in the Affordable show a couple of times. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so might we hear that with the Missing Man formation? There's a strong possibility. Cool. I don't want to give away too much. But. Well, that and maybe others. So. Well, look good. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, trying to keep the spirit alive here. And it's a damn good song. It's real... Uh, uh, actually, Scott Matthews sings that one, but uh, he sings it really well. He's got a husky voice. Will he be there? Uh, yeah, I, I believe Scott's going to guest with us, and uh, maybe Bobby Strickland from the Affordables. Also, come in. Second Sight. Uh huh. And uh, anybody else wants to drop by and jump up on stage can probably uh, work him into the act. Well, let's talk about this band of yours, all of whom are fantastic players that we've heard in various contexts over the years. And we happen to have one of them here with us. Mm-hmm. Bobby Vega. Maybe you want guy. to come sit a little closer. You want the uh, hot seat? No. Uh, I'm glad we could have the hot seat. <laughs> 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 God, I'm trying to remember the first time I heard you play. It was uh, I, I remember you from playing with Nikki's High Noon and the, yeah. the music to be born by and all sorts of... Did you play with the uh, Weir in one of those, back in like 86 in one of those... Uh, uh, one of the Kingfish things yeah. for a minute. I for think, a yeah, minute. yeah, for a minute, you know, like three days for, you know, those week tours and then... Yeah. yeah. And you've been sort of loosely affiliated with this crowd for yeah. years and years, but you play mostly with Zero these days? Mostly with Zero, yes. I was, for a while, I was, for the last, what, six years, I was working with Etta James, and I was doing that for a while, and so I was, like, away from Zero, because I couldn't really work both of them at the same time. Uh -huh. And then now, um, for the last three years, I'm back with Zero, like a full, was, or I am, full time. How are things going for Zero? Good. That uh, you, that double live album got picked up by uh, Horizon Records. The, oh yeah, that's right. It's, it's like a, I think it's a single one. Oh. Chance in a million. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yep. I should say that again. <laughs> <laughs> say what? I was checking yeah, out the, your the, wedding ring. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> Whoa. Right there. Nice. Can everybody see that? <laughs> Well, and you got a record of your own coming out now. Yes. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit and hear a little bit of that. Okay. Um, let's see, I have the Turtle Island String Quartet. That's Daryl Anger and uh, who else uh, is in there? That's Mark great, Summer. Great band. And Tracy uh, uh, Silverman, I think it is. And I uh, forget the other couple. There's a couple other people. Sorry, you guys. Um, <laughs> I'll leave this part yeah, out. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we'll embarrass ourselves. And not go with. So we'll go back and say you got the Turtle Island String Quartet. I have the Turtle Island String Quartet. Oh, Again. The Turtle Island String Quartet's on it. Uh -huh. And I have Ayrto playing on all seven songs. And Steve Kimmock plays on three songs. Steve Kimmock. What a fine guitar player he is. Yeah, but that's... Uh, hey, man. Boy. We go back... I guess that's how I got into Kingfish, is with through Steve. And then we've been hanging ever since. It's kind of like we're like kind of paired up here and there and blah -dee blah And Prairie Prince has been an associate of yours, Vince, for what, <coughs> 30 Jeez. years or something? Uh, yeah, time. I mean, I know him from Phoenix. We used to play in the same club in different bands, and then we actually played in the same band, uh, starting with the Tubes, but even before that when it was called The Beans. We were all piled into one house on Noriega Street and came out like in 71. But I, I've been playing with Perry since the 60s, late 60s. And then we did the tubes for about, together for about 17 years. And he went on the road with Todd and I for a couple of albums and a couple tours and then the Affordables, among other bands. And there was the Valentines and there was Special K and the Serial Killers. <laughs> One off in Japan, Fukuoka. Okay, let's talk about Bobby's that. Bobby's in that. <coughs> Go for it, Bobby. That must have been a fun trip. That was great. 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, what you broke us in, didn't you? I, I got to be a sort of rehearsal dummy there. I sat in for a wee-er uh, at a couple of rehearsals when you guys were working through those tunes. That's, That's right. That's right, yeah. Because yeah. Henry, uh, and so it, was, it was Henry Kaiser and Prairie and you, Bobby, on bass and Vince on keyboards and... And you? Well, I was just the tackling dummy it. there for the work. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it was fun, but... So, yeah. but how did that gig happen to, I mean, how, do you, how does one get a one-off gig in a big arena in Fukuoka, Japan? Well, I don't even know how that one came up. That would have to be you, Vince. Uh, I don't know. I think Henry, uh, Henry called me and, and laid it on me. Uh, it was to promote uh, an event that wasn't going to be for another year. But uh, these guys wanted some San Francisco musicians, and they wanted them bad. And... Uh, we were just the guys to want to go over there and and do it. And we played this huge dome, the Fukuoka Dome, <clears throat> which is beautiful. It has a big three-quarters opening dome thing that opens up into the sky, which it's is huge. very elaborate. And it was cool, and we had a good time. We had some press photos taken at the bathhouses, and thank God they haven't ever come out. <laughs> but... Uh, it was a good, good trip. Say more. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, nude photos of Bob Weir would fetch a handsome price in the deadhead uh, underground economy. Well, I don't know yeah. about the rest of you ugly guys, but <laughs> well, I don't know if there were any fluffers there that day. Or not. No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that gig sort of led to the Valentine's show, right? Yeah. It was that. Did yeah. that come first? Yes, it did. Then the Valentines. That was a very, very fun show. That was a lot of fun. I had a bunch of fun. Kind of, it was kind of squished on stage, so we were kind of up there in front of the other gear, but that was a bunch of fun. Oh, that's right. It was uh, the Jefferson, uh, uh, Jefferson. Star, uh, <coughs> the Jeffersons. Uh, yeah. With Starfish. Oh, with Prairie was doing double duty that day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, one of the things I like about those all those bands that you've been doing, Vince, is you're sort of... Um, you like you do all sorts of fun pop tunes in the 60s I mean you never, sort of never know what you're going to hear you know the Valentines had Play With Fire in there and it was it was it Love's Made a Fool of You is that a Buddy Holly tune? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know you sort of like you never know what's going to come up like well, a great bar band yeah, that well, can jam <laughs> Henry just got a million of them that he wants you to do so it's just a matter of which ones you uh calling out the ones you can't do or don't have the time for, but he's just keeps on firing up. He uh, whipped out Cream Puff Wars, and, and I mean, when you got a guy that's that enthusiastic and happy and, and knows all the chords and he's got it written up real pretty on uh, on blown up uh, computerized paper and all that, all that good stuff, all ready made, you know, then you gotta just wanna do it. But you know, fun is the best thing to have, isn't it? And the 60s was always a special time in my life. I was having a great deal of fun then. And I think the music is lingering in my mind, just like the remnants of the LSD that never goes away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm flashing right now. All that, all those Beatles songs, too. Damn right. You know, James you Brown. Do lots of Beatles, Brown. Hendrix. I'd like to hear Henry Kaiser vamping on Sex Machine. That would be fun. Used to do it with the tubes. Wow. We did it. It's a brand new day, so stand up and do the funky popcorn. It was like one of those nine song medleys by James that had Sex Machine in it. And love that tune. I still do uh, Man's World, or I try to do it, although he does it in E flat. Who? Oh, James Brown? Yeah. And uh, just to give you an idea of how high he can sing. I, the highest I ever sang is in D, and I think I'm down to C now, <laughs> if I attempt it. Well, it doesn't matter what key it's in, as long as it works, right? Sure. It's not bad for a white kid, I guess. Well, we've got, we've covered the Affordables, we've covered the Valentines, we've covered the Fukuoka <clears throat> Dome, we've covered Bobby's record. I guess we better bring Merle in now. Eh? Yay. You ready? I'm ready. You haven't dozed off while this is going on? Huh? Do you want to take a seat? Might help. Is that better?